gentlemen. Um, first of all, I want to kill one very nasty and unkind rumor. As you know, we were at the observatory uh, yesterday when there was a ground tremor. And the story is this was caused by me jumping off the rock. <laughs> now, this is totally untrue. Um, I cannot cause anything louder than a Mercalli scale 2. And this was at least three and a half, so it wasn't me. <laughs> Perfectly true. Um, I have been doing my Sky at Night program now for the last 35 years, jolly nearly. And um, uh, a little while ago, I was over in the Isle of Wight for some reason or other. And uh, when I was there, somebody came up to me and said, yes, I've seen you on television. I think your programs are wonderful. Let me know when you're next on, because I never miss you. You are Billy Graham, aren't you? <laughs> That's a perfectly true story. There are plenty of stories about the sky at night. I won't bore you with those, except on the classic occasion many years ago, when I was on the air, live, and I opened my mouth to make some world-shattering pronouncement, and in flew a very large fly. <laughs> to my eternal credit, I swallowed it. <laughs> the producer said he saw a look of glazed horror come into my eyes, and I gave a strangled gulp and went on. And my mother had the answer later, said, yes, darling, so nasty for you, so much worse for the fly. <laughs> <laughs> However, that's neither here nor there. I may say that um, we have a, a rather different program from that we originally envisaged, because when we planned these talks originally, and that was a long time ago, we thought we were going to have, first of all, the um, Hawaii audience, and then the Mexico audience, or the other way around. We didn't know we were going to have both together. And the fact that we have got people here, going both to Hawaii and or Mexico, means that John, who's going to follow me, is going to say rather, what's well, going to take him obviously, rather longer than we expected, and therefore, I'm not going to detain you for very long. But uh, I want to just clear the air about one or two eclipse matters, say some things about safety that are going to be repeated by all our other speakers, and also tell you just one or two eclipse stories, all of which are going to be relevant to what we hope we're going to see within the next few days. So first of all, may I have a show of hands for anyone here who genuinely doesn't know anything about eclipses and may not know an asteroid from an adenoid. <laughs> hands up please those who don't know anything at all. <laughs> Fine, very few, therefore I needn't in fact detain you very much with this, except that in the old days, uh, the old Chinese believed that eclipses were caused by a hungry dragon trying to devour the sun. May I have my first slide please? And, um, there's a picture of a dragon trying to devour the sun, and I will let you into a secret. That isn't actually what happens. <laughs> there is a lovely story going back well before the BC times that um, the, you can actually forecast eclipses reasonably well by a process of simple addition, because um, one eclipse is liable to be followed by another one just over 18 years later. And therefore, in theory, you can do it, and the Chinese court astrologers were expected to be able to do this. But on this occasion, all kinds of equipment, and he didn't have any. All he had was a deck chair. And I said, what are you doing this time? And he said, I have been to many eclipses. I have observed many eclipses. I have researched many eclipses. I have never looked at an eclipse. <laughs> this time, I do absolutely nothing. <laughs> and all he did throughout totality, he lay back in his deck chair and enjoyed the eclipse. And the point I'm making here, uh, this is why I showed this slide, is that when we have our eclipse, don't spend all your time photographing it or making experiments. Spend part of the time, anyway, in relaxing and enjoying it. It's the most marvelous sight you'll ever see, so don't spend all your time peering through a camera lens. Sit back for a while anyway, and just enjoy the sight. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed. And that's the lesson of that particular eclipse. The next set of two or three slides has hadn't really got a moral. Uh, way back in 1961, there was an eclipse, the track of which covered part of Europe, uh, into Yugoslavia where I was, and then off into Russia. And we were doing a, a broadcast about this, 
I think the very first television broadcast of an eclipse from three different sites. First of all from France, then from Italy, and then from Yugoslavia, where I was, on top of Mount Yastrovac, and there we are, being um, in theory, pulled up to the mountain with our equipment by those rather stupid mountain oxen. I'll try to part of the story later. And I may say, we've had an international television meeting about this earlier on in Paris, uh, United Nations, chaired by a Dane named Eddie, and uh, we had a rather sticky uh, uh, Spanish delegation there, and also a rather sticky Italian delegation. And uh, the Spanish wanted to join in, and I pointed out that the eclipse track didn't cross Spain. And the producer said, but can't this be altered? <laughs> and then the Italians were getting very stuffy indeed, and at lunchtime, uh, our Danish chairman said to me, um, well, what he actually meant was, uh, take these gentlemen out to lunch and give them something to drink. Wasn't quite how he put it, that's what he meant. And when they came back, they were very much more amenable, and in fact, the Croat isn't very good. So I talked French to a Belgian astronomer who relayed it in German, to the top Yugoslav, who passed it on in serbo Croat. Now, you'll see, when the totality begins, and it begins very, very suddenly, all nature seems to stop. There's a kind of hush. Everything goes into hibernation, while all one's attention is directed to the sky. You're going to notice that very vividly. It's sudden, it's dramatic, it's breathtaking. And the theory is that birds start to roost, and animals go to sleep. And as I've said, we did have these rather stupid mountain oxen that had towed our equipment we thought to the top of the mountain, even though I remember pushing them halfway. And the producer had a very good idea. He thought, well, um, when totality starts, um, turn the cameras onto the oxen and show them going to sleep. Nice little nature note. And just to make sure everyone could see them nicely, he floodlit the boats. <laughs> made a gesture that no one could misinterpret, even in Sobo Croat, and he got back to the sun. And finally we came down the mountain, uh, oh, there's just after totality, we came down to the little village right at the bottom of Mount Yastrovac, and where there was only one pub there, and uh, they sold a sleeve of it, which is Yugoslav plum brandy, and we had several of those and waited for the two jeeps to come and take us back into the town, and eventually the two jeeps turned up, and we then decided there was only one, which there was, and finally we got back. It was great fun. <laughs> now I'll turn up your camera uh, at the start of totality, and then click away. You have to adjust halfway through, otherwise you may find that the sun has moved out of your field if you're using a telescopic lens. If, of course, you're using a wide angle, well, it's a different matter. For some people who may do what I am going to try and do during totality, and sweep round looking for any stray comets that may be around. There was one classic case way back in 1882, which I didn't see myself, <laughs> when uh, the first eclipse really well photographed, and uh, when the photographs came out, there was a comet, never seen before and never seen afterwards. And so that one photograph is the only record we have of it. In history, we call it Tufix Comet. In 1948, there was another comet discovered during an eclipse. That one was tracked afterwards, so we do know about it. But all the same, if you want to try a bit of relief, well, sweep round very briefly with binoculars and John Mason to take you through what's actually going to happen now. I hope that what I've said has been useful to you. And I've got just one final tip, and this is addressed only to photographers, and it's quite simply this. Remember, if you are going to photograph the total eclipse, don't use flash. <laughs>